Good, good afternoon. The meeting will come to order. It is time, April 22nd, 2022. This is the second quarterly meeting of the Commission on the Social Status of Black Men and Boys. It is a public meeting and the live broadcast on YouTube through the National Press Club. I want to extend a warm welcome to the commissioners and our public audience. As always, our mission will be to exchange ideas, implement our expertise while continuing to work to recommend solutions for the advancement of black men and boys through this new commission. I must reiterate that this commission isn't built on politics. It's built on humanity, empathy, unification, dedication, persistence, but most importantly, the desire for change. We must create stronger communities and an equitable society for everyone. We began our work in January by deeming the year 2022-2023 as the year of black men and boys. Today, I'm so pleased to announce that we will have this roundtable discussion on the impact of the criminal justice system on black men and boys in America, followed by a very brief business meeting that will include appointments of the members of the 2022 Annual Report Subcommittee. I now recognize the Commission's Program Manager, Dr. Marvin Williams, who will conduct the roll call and establish a quorum. Dr. Williams. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, per the statute, a majority of the members of the commission, which is 10 members, constitute a quorum. Uh, to establish the quorum, I will call each member by name. Please note your presence by saying here. Uh, Chair Wilson, of course. <laughs> here. Um, uh, Secretary, uh, um, Secretary Sharpton. Commissioner Beatty. Commissioner Bowman. Commissioner Brewer. Here. Commissioner Caesar. Here. Commissioner Clark. Here. Commissioner uh, Colclaw. Here. Commissioner Dillard. Here. Commissioner Elder. Commissioner Faustin. Here. Commissioner Horsford. Here. Commissioner Jeffries. Commissioner Johnson. Here. Commissioner Marshall. Present. Commissioner McBath. Commissioner McGriver. Here. Commissioner Olika. Here. Commissioner Rhodes. Here. Madam Chair, uh, for the record, please note that a quorum of the commissioners is present. Thank you. The next order of business is the adoption of the agenda. May I have a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Second. Without objection, the uh, agenda for the meeting is adopted. I want to acknowledge and thank us for the first vice president of the Congressional Black Caucus will serve as our moderator. He is a member of the commission and is a strong advocate for black men and boys, a hardworking legislator for the people of Nevada. He has agreed to pitch it for Commissioner Reverend Shopton, who is delivering the eulogy today for Patrick Lyoya of Michigan an unarmed black man who was shot in the back of the head by a police officer, which elevates our conversation and our job that we must accomplish. We are honored to have House Majority Whip Reverend Jim, Representative Jim Clyburn 
from South Carolina who will present the historical perspective on black men and boys in America. Representative Clyburn is a gifted historian who knows so much and can share so much. It is an honor to have him here with us today. Followed by the United States Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights, Commissioner Christian Clark. We are so, so proud of her. She will open our discussion today with her perspective on the overall representation of black men and boys in the criminal justice system. And that is only the beginning. Benjamin Crump, the internationally renowned civil rights attorney. We call him Black America's Attorney General. Dr. Raymond Hart, Executive Director of the Council of Great City Schools. Criminal justice reform begins in our schools. Choices and peer pressure can change a child's entire life. Commissioner Calvin Johnson, Deputy Assistant Secretary for the Department of Housing and Urban Development, HUD, who worked in the world of prisons, jails, and other penal institutions. Congressman Hank Johnson from the state of Georgia, an executive committee member of the Congressional Black Caucus, eminently qualified to opine on today's topics. Desmond Mead, founder of the Florida Rights Restoration Coalition, who has restored the rights of so many returning citizens and is a history maker in our nation. Commissioner Clark will also be one of the participants in the roundtable discussion. Our attorney, assistant attorney general for civil rights for the civil rights division of the United States. I'm so excited now to bring forward our moderator and commissioner, our beloved representative from Nevada, Stephen Horsfoot. So at this time, I will turn the discussion over to him. Commissioner well, Horsfoot. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Chair Wilson. And I am so delighted to be a part of this historic moment as we come together to work on solutions as agents of change in the context of the impact of the criminal justice system on black men and boys. Uh, one of the goals of the Commission on the Social Status of Black Men and Boys is to study the disparity Black men and boys experience in our criminal justice system. Because we all know firsthand the realities many of our young Black men face with the lack of job opportunities, lack of educational and skills development, um, and uh, a lack of presence of active and engaged fathers uh, in some households. Uh, this roundtable discussion today will include some amazing trailblazers and champions from government, academia, and advocacy to make sure our young Black men and boys can obtain the resources that they need to live a life of purpose, dignity, and free from the injustices we have historically endured in this country. So without further ado, let us proceed uh, by welcoming uh, the, our great champion, uh, my mentor and friend, the United States House of Representatives Majority Whip, Congressman Jim Clyburn from South Carol Carolina, who will present a historical perspective on black men and boys in America. Representative Clyburn, we'll turn it well, to you. Thank you very much, uh, Representative Horsfoot. Uh, Representative Wilson, thank you so much uh, for uh, not, uh, only your effort here today, but your long history with this. I have been uh, in your congressional district several times, uh, being a part of the work uh, that you have done with your 5,000 role models. In fact, I was with you in a foreign country uh, several years ago uh, when I looked and there among one of the presenters uh, was a young man with his red tie on and 5,000 role models. And I said to you then, you have gone 
international with your efforts. So I want to thank her so much for all that she has done uh, with this issue. I'm sitting in Orangeburg, South Carolina. Uh, I'm here today with our EPA administrator, uh, an African-American from North Carolina, uh, North Carolina A&T. Um, and uh, I mentioned that for a reason I'll get to in a minute. And also our Secretary of Commerce, uh, uh, who is here uh, with us today, as well uh, as the so-called czar uh, of the President's Infrastructure Program, Mitchell Andrew. These three people are here. We're all sitting uh, about uh, two blocks from the site of the three young men, two college students and a high school student. Uh, who were shot uh, and killed by law enforcement officers here in South Carolina that led uh, to the infamous Orangeburg massacre. We are here uh, presenting issues that are historical that have led uh, to some circumstances here in South Carolina, in Orangeburg, that have a historical foundation. Alexis de Tocqueville, who I studied as a student at South Carolina State uh, here in Orangeburg, came to this country to study our penal system. He saw back in the 1830s what he called a progressive system. He talked about it as being a magical thing in this country. And he wrote a two volume uh, book called Democracy in America. And the Tocqueville's Democracy in America can be summed up in one little phrase that I want to share with you. The Tocqueville said, America is not great because it is more enlightened than any other nation, but rather because it has always been able to repair its faults. Think about that. Always been able to repair its faults. We have seen some fault lines opened in America in recent days, not just with George Floyd, but as recent as the one who is being penalized today when it comes to our justice system. But if you look at the foundation of this, how did we get here? We have to look at some more recent history. Look at what happened uh, in this country after the stock market crashed back in 1929. And we had to make some decisions about whether or not uh, this country could come back together and continue its pursuit, its pursuit of per perfection. In 1935, we passed legislation that Congress did uh, to bring this country back. One of those pieces of legislation was Social Security. And it's kind of interesting uh, that Social Security uh, was called one of the biggest anti-poverty programs ever, except that Social Security left certain job classifications uncovered. Among them were domestic workers were uncovered. Farm workers were not covered. And 65% of all of the African-Americans living in this country at that time were employed in those two areas. So 65% of African-Americans from, from the 1930s were not covered by the recovery efforts that were put together. After World War II that ended in the early 1945, World War II came to a close and so many African-Americans came back 
from the war, having been a part of saving this country's freedom. We all remember the stories of the Tuskegee Airmen, their hero heroism in uh, saving uh, this country uh, and delivering a, victor a victory uh, in, um, in World War II. When they came home, the country decided to resettle uh, all of its veterans, uh, the people who fought the war by passing the GI Bill. The GI Bill was to uh, get uh, restore stability to these young men lives, providing resources for them to purchase homes and get an education. It just so happens that in the first 3,000 people that got the benefit of the GI Bill, I wanna say that again, of the first 3,000 people who got the benefit of the GI Bill, only two, not 2%, only two went to African-Americans. So to stabilize the communities with new homes, to get education in order to pay uh, for their children, it was closed to them. These are the foundations, the pillars upon which things began to develop. And all of us know that if you look at the system, the so-called penal system, the justice system, those people who run afoul of the law, and you look into their educational backgrounds, you'll find that they were lacking in educational opportunities and attainment. The same thing happens with communities when they have not been able to come out of stable communities. That's the backdrop to this. Now, I want you to think about that as you do your work with this commission. And think about what the Tocqueville said when he wrote, America's greatness is because it has always been able to repair its faults. As a commission, you are going to look at a lot of fault lines in this country. We saw it with COVID-19, and we are going to see it time and time again, unless we do what is necessary to repair these fault lines. I am looking forward to the work of this commission coming forth in such a way that will arm the United States Congress with the wherewithal it needs to put in place programs and funding that will allow us to stabilize communities, to educate young people, to provide the resources, as we say in the Congress, the ways and means in order to develop productive citizens. I'm looking forward to the results of your work. And I wanna thank each and every one of you uh, for heeding this call and thank you, Frederica, for your perseverance. I know what you went through getting this commission established. And quite frankly, I guess I might be among those who doubted that you could ever get it done. <laughs> but you did it. And by God, I thank you for it. And I yield. Thank you very much, uh, Representative and Majority Whip Clyburn, uh, for your insightful and informative perspectives regarding the history um, and, and how that history uh, has uh, laid a lot of the foundation for where we see ourselves uh, as a society. Um, and thank you again uh, for your leadership in me being able to move forward important legislation, including uh, the recommendations that will come from this commission under the leadership of Chair Wilson uh, and the commissioners. Uh, so thank you very much for your contribution uh, today and uh, for your commitment to Black men and boys and in the United States and for everyone. 
Now, before we get into the thick of today's discussion on the impact of the criminal justice system on black men and black boys in America, let us take a moment to listen to Commissioner Clark's perspective on the overrepresentation of black men and boys within the criminal justice system. Commissioner Clark. Thank you uh, so very much, Representative Horsford. I want to also thank Chair Wilson uh, for her leadership program, Manager Williams, and House Majority Whip Claiborne, Clyburn for setting the stage today, and my fellow co uh, commissioners. It's a real pleasure to be here today. My name is Kristen Clark. I serve as the Assistant Attorney General for the Civil Rights Division at the Justice Department. and. I appreciate the important mandate of this commission, figuring out how we can confront some of the grave challenges and crises facing black men and black boys today. And I wanna talk very briefly about uh, some of our core priorities inside the civil rights division that I think can help set a framework for our discussion. Uh, and that is uh, our work to ensure accountability in the public's interactions with law enforcement and the conditions, the unconstitutional conditions that we see inside state and local jails, prisons, and juvenile detention facilities across our country. Um, but before I talk about that, I just want to note that uh, you know we know that Black people, including Black men and boys, are subject to hate crimes, including racially motivated threats and racially motivated violence at alarming rates. FBI statistics show that during the pandemic, there was a rise in hate crimes committed against Black Americans, already the group uh, most frequently targeted in other groups. The tragic killing of Ahmaud Arbery is one recent example. And just last month, the Justice Department secured federal hate crimes and attempted kidnapping convictions against the three men who were responsible for the murder of Mr. Arbery. And these convictions make clear that Mr. Arby was killed because of his race. So from Emmett Till to James Byrd to Ahmaud Arbery, we continue to see evidence that makes clear that hate crimes and racially motivated violence have been intractable problems for our country. And must, we must continue to do all we can to confront this crisis. But turning to our criminal justice system, we know that the majority of the nation's 18,000 law enforcement agencies police our communities with professionalism, respect, and integrity. But we also know that there are incidents of unlawful uses of excessive force and deadly force by individual officers. And we also see systemic unconstitutional policing practices carried out by agencies. And these problems undermine community trust and public safety. The world watched in the summer of 2020 as Americans from every corner of the country took to, took to the streets to demand justice for George Floyd and so many others who have uh, needlessly lost their lives. And these protests were about shining a light on the need for a more fair criminal justice system, a more fair policing system in our country. The civil rights division that I lead has worked to hold individual police officers accountable for misconduct. And that includes recent convictions secured against all four former Minneapolis police officers uh, on federal civil rights violations tied to the death of Mr. George Floyd. And those convictions send a clear message, a clear message to officers across the country that they must use only reasonable force that they have a proactive duty to intervene to protect the constitutional rights of all people in this country and that they can be held and will be held accountable when they violate our federal civil rights laws. Alongside these prosecutions is our work to look at police departments that are engaged in an unlawful pattern or practice of violating the constitution we have opened pattern or practice investigations into police departments in Louisville, Minneapolis, Phoenix, and Mount Vernon, New York. And just last week announced a consent decree with the Springfield, Massachusetts Police Department. Our work to investigate allegations of unconstitutional policing is a top priority. Jails and prisons 
for the more than 2 million people in this country who are residing in prisons and jails, it's imperative that we remedy the unconstitutional conditions that we too often see. Black men are overrepresented in the country's penal institutions by a factor of five compared to white men. As one example in Georgia, where last year we opened a civil rights investigation into the state's prisons, the percentage of incarcerated people who are black is nearly twice the percentage of black residents overall. And we open an investigation looking at issues that include prisoner on prisoner violence, severe staff shortages and more. And earlier this week, we opened an investigation into Parchman, the Mississippi State Penitentiary. Um, this is the state's oldest uh, state prison and we uncovered violations of the eighth and fourth, 14th amendment. Um, black Mississippians account for 70% of Parchman's incarcerated po uh, population, despite making up only 37% of the state's population. The conditions at Parchman are so dire that they have resulted in 12 suicides and 10 homicides since 2019. We found inadequate mental health treatment, inadequate suicide prevention measures, over reliance on solitary confinement and more. The constitution safeguards the inherent dignity of every human being in our country, including those detained in our prisons and jails. Indeed, the Supreme Court has observed that there is no iron curtain drawn between the constitution and the prisons of this country. All of the issues that I have noted illustrate some of those fault lines that Congressman Clyburn mentioned a moment ago. True justice, true racial justice requires that all people be able to trust that their interactions with the criminal justice system are constitutionally sound and just. And it requires that we give new focus on the ongoing problems of racially motivated hate crimes and violence that we see in our country. While there is more work to be done, know that the Civil Rights Division and my colleagues across the Justice Department stand ready to confront these challenges. We're committed to using every tool at our disposal in the pursuit of a more racially just and equitable society. And I look forward to continued work with this commission to help shine a light on these crises and to identify new robust strategies that can be deployed in this fight. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Clark. And uh, we're very fortunate to have you leading uh, the, the Civil Division, Civil Rights Division within the Department of Justice, and uh, also to have you uh, as, as an active member of this commission. Um, so thank you for your tremendous uh, leadership. So we're going to jump into this conversation now with our panel. Uh, and given the insightful comments from uh, both uh, Majority Whip Clyburn and Commissioner Clark, uh, we want to frame the discussion on the criminal justice system uh, by posing a question to each of the panelists that focused on uh, that focuses on their area of expertise. Uh, first, I'm going to go to my uh, good friend and colleague, Representative uh, Hank Johnson from the great state of Georgia. Uh, you've been a pioneer in criminal justice reform. Uh, you've been a key advocate for the marijuana legalization bill, as well as the anti-lynching bill, which was just recently signed into law by President Biden. Uh, these are landmark victories uh, for the Black community, especially Black males. Given the disproportionate rate of incarceration and violence imposed on, on Black men, what impact will these laws or legislation have on changing how Black men are treated within the current judicial system Additionally, what other reforms in these areas are needed or will help with the implementation of these bills? You're on, you're on mute, uh, Commissioner Johnson. Thank you so much, Representative Horsford. Uh, and um, it's very great to be here with all of you all. I want to um, give my kudos to Representative Frederica Wilson out of Florida, who has made the um, salvation of black men and boys uh, her life's work. Uh, it's 
a topic and an issue that is often left uh, to the sidelines, uh, but Representative Wilson has worked tireless, tirelessly to ensure that this issue remains at the forefront and receives the kinds of attention that it uh, desperately needs and deserves. And so I wanna uh, thank her for uh, inviting me to participate in this round table. And I bring 27 years of um, criminal law experience as a criminal defense lawyer and also as a uh, associate magistrate judge uh, to the equation uh, that we are talking about today. I understand how it is a gateway into the criminal justice system, uh, catching a charge of uh, possession of less than an ounce of marijuana has been historically for our black men uh, and uh, for our boys. You know, law enforcement uh, catches someone using recreational uh, marijuana or using marijuana for recreational use, charges them, that enters them into the criminal justice system. Next thing you know, they're targeted when they are riding in their car because they run the tag, police run the tag, see that so-and-so is on probation uh, for uh, marijuana possession. They pull a person over, might be someone in the car with a, a weapon uh, or whatever the case might be. Then that young person gets charged with the weapon, uh, pleads out, can't afford an attorney, uh, pleads out and um, ends up with another offense, which leads to a felony offense at some point down the line. And then incarceration, which has such a, uh, a tremendously uh, devastating impact on families and on communities and on states and on the nation. And this has been something that has been taking place historically uh, among uh, the Black people of this country. And so when uh, we do something to shut down that gateway or to begin the shutting down of the gateway from, uh, from the use of marijuana into the hard life of the criminal justice system, then we're actually benefiting our society. You know, statistics show that Black men and boys use marijuana at the same rates as white men and boys, but are four times more likely to be arrested for uh, cannabis possession than our white counterparts. And in the, and in the United States, 600,000 people are arrested every year for cannabis-related offenses. The federal government criminalized the possession of marijuana or cannabis in 1937, and when it did so, it listed cannabis as a Schedule I controlled substance for purposes of criminal prosecution, alongside hard drugs like heroin, LSD, and ecstasy. And in 1951, Congress passed a law that set harsh mandatory sentencing of two to 10 years in prison and a fine of up to $20,000 for a first offense possession of cannabis case. And people of color have been historically targeted by discriminatory sentencing practices, resulting in black men receiving drug sentences that are 13.1% longer than sentences imposed on white men for the same offense. So I'm glad that society norms, societal norms and laws are beginning to change. A total of 47 states have reformed their laws pertaining to cannabis, despite marijuana remaining a Schedule I drug. Cannabis is now a big business, and with legal cannabis sales totaling $20 billion in 2020, and with projected sales reaching $40 billion by 2025, uh, it's a big business, but not surprisingly, only 4% of cannabis business owners are Black. And it's ironic that those most hurt by criminalization of cannabis are 
uh, excluded from the legal cannabis marketplace because of prior cannabis-related convictions. So on April Fool's Day of 2022, the House passed the Marijuana Opportunity Reinvestment and Expungement Act, Expungement Act, also known as the Moore Act, that decriminalizes cannabis as a controlled substance. This is huge. The Moore Act establishes a process to expunge convictions and conduct uh, and conduct sentencing review hearings related to federal cannabis offenses. And it prohibits the denial of federal public benefits to a person on the basis of certain cannabis related conduct or convictions. And the law also authorizes the Small Business Administration to make loans and services available to entities that are cannabis related legitimate businesses or service providers. And it requires the Bureau of Labor Statistics to regularly pub publish demographic data on cannabis business owners and employees so that equity and inclusion rates can be tracked and dealt with. And the act also establishes a trust fund to support various programs and services for individuals and businesses in communities impacted by the war on drugs. So the MORE Act is a huge step forward as we shut down the gateway from recreational use of cannabis into the criminal justice system and move towards uh, equity and inclusion in the legal cannabis market. So I thank you for that question. Thank you, uh, Congressman and Commissioner. Well, I'm saying Congressman Johnson. I know you're one of our panelists today. I'm, uh, and I wanna move now to um, Benjamin Crump, uh, Attorney Benjamin Crump, who uh, as the chair indicated has been um, just a leader uh, on so many fronts. Uh, and you have walked the painful journey with far too many families, unfortunately, uh, across this country in publicizing, advocating, and litigating for the civil rights of Black men who have lost their lives. So you have a unique uh, perspective to view the underlying, underlying systemic patterns that are present in many of these cases. What would you propose as the first steps for the transformative and constructive reform of the criminal justice system and its impact on black men and boys. Attorney Crump. Commissioner Horsford, uh, Attorney Crump is also attending the funeral of Mr. Lyoya, but he is going to call in. And when he calls in, we will take him. So thank you. You can proceed to uh, Mr. Desmond Mead. Thank you, Chair Wilson. All right. So Desmond, uh, in discussions on criminal justice reform, your organization, uh, the Florida uh, Rights Restoration Coalition, uh, is, is, is a prominent voice for Black males that navigates the complexity between punishment and rehabilitation. Uh, as you have outlined, restoration of voting and other rights of citizens returning to society after incarceration embodies the American spirit on both spiritual and secular grounds. So what solutions do you propose, including post and pre-release policies or a cr criminal justice reform act that would minimize the obstacles and help facilitate national restoration of voting rights for black men and boys uh, with felony convictions? First of all, thank you for that question, uh, Representative Horsford. Uh, I'd like to actually um, extend some gratitude to Chairwoman Wilson uh, for inviting me uh, to be on this panel uh, and definitely um, a sense of, of joy to see an old colleague, uh, Assistant Attorney General Kristen Clark on. It's very comforting to see you. Uh, and as you were, as you was talking, um, you know, what I was thinking, you, you used some words uh, about uniquely positioned when you was talking about uh, Attorney Crump. And, and I was smiling because, you know, uh, this 
uh, topic of discussion gets very deep and it goes even beyond uh, uh, just voting, right? And it, the reason why it does is because, um, and, and, and I have a way of uh, actually even qualifying myself, you know, I am a returning citizen. I am a person uh, that has experienced the other side of, uh, of the criminal justice system, uh, been in and out of jails and, and, and prisons, and uh, even had to battle a substance abuse addiction uh, to a point where in August of 2005, I was standing in front of railroad tracks, waiting on a train to come so I can jump in front of it. Uh, and and, and I, 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 I'm here today with my head held very high and my shoulders thrown back a little bit and my chest out uh, uh, because of the unique qualifications that I know I'm able to bring to this discussion. You know, as a person that has uh, been uh, on the other side of the criminal justice system as, as an addict, uh, but also as a person who has been able to transform his life right, and navigate the challenges that this commission will be addressing uh, to uh, uh, serve on, on many boards. Uh, most recently, I served with a former Attorney General, Loretta Lynch and Alberta Gonzalez in the National Task Force in COVID and prisons, uh, uh, to leading, of course, the effort that you mentioned, alluded to, the Amendment 4 effort that restored voting rights to 1.4 million uh, people with felony convictions in Florida to uh, being named by Time Magazine, one of the 100, let me say it again, 100 most influential people in the world and, and to most recently being named a MacArthur Genius Fellow. Uh, so now I'm officially a genius, uh, but I think what uh, the point that I, I'm trying to make is I, I think that, you know, this is what I'm bringing all of me uh, uh, to this discussion and to your question, right? And, and, and what I believe through my journey on, on both sides, you know, I, like I said, I've been the, the target of prosecutors and judges, and but now I'm also a, a colleague of prosecutors and, 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 and judges. I believe that, you know, there's so much, I mean, we hear the stats day in and day out. We can always... A lot of us could just rattle off these stats about, about the disproportionate impact of policing, uh, especially what they have on Black men and boys. But I want to start from somewhere different, right? I firmly believe, right, that, that and we all can agree that we, we, with the adage that a chain is only as strong as its weakest link, that no matter how much weight we want a chain to bear, it would only be able to hold as much weight as that the weakest link could handle. And I believe that this is true in our society, in, in, in our communities, in, in our states, in this country, that if we do aspire to be greater than what we are today, that it is imperative that we focus on the segments of society that have been most weakened by systems of oppression and systems of discrimination and, and narratives that say that some lives are less valuable than others, right? And I, I really believe that the segment of our society that has been most weakened have been black men and boys, right? And, and so we are that key, right? That, that we can't get greater, you can't get greater, this country can't get greater until the black men and boys that have been impacted by the criminal justice system are empowered. One thing I do know is that what I believe drives a lot of the challenges that we have to the empowerment of black men and boys is a narrative. It's a narrative. And I believe that if we can address that narrative, right? And, and some folks might be like, well, where is he going with this? Right, what, what I do know is this. Uh, um, and and it, there's a book out there called The uh, um, Black Americans and the Atomic Bomb that speaks about the African-American's response to the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And in that book, it talks about the campaign that the United States engaged in prior to the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. 
where uh, uh, the Japanese people were were depicted as violent, dangerous individuals. Uh, characters that were drawn of them were grossly exaggerated, right? And in engaging in this propaganda campaign, what the United States was able to do was they was able to dehumanize the Japanese people, and they were also able to desensitize us as to their humanity. So when they did drop the bomb and kill thousands of innocent children, women, and men, rather than there being public or moral outrage, there was a public celebration, right? That's the power of a narrative. And that's the same narrative that we have uh, uh, been the subject of for so many years, right? And, and, and we can go back to the days of slavery, that black men are dangerous. Uh, uh, they're, 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 they're not as smart as strategic. Uh, uh, there could be super predators. And we have to keep black men and boys at heel. And so we can put our foot on their neck for eight minutes, 46 seconds, because that's how we control them, right? And, and so I believe that that narrative is still, is the same narrative that allows us not to, to look at people who've been impacted by the criminal justice system differently and as, as if they're other people, right? I, I think I was fortunate enough that, that God had chose me to, for, uh, uh, for this mission of his uh, 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 in liberation, to allow me to go through this metamorphosis to demonstrate to everyone that just because I have a felony conviction does not minimize, right, the value that I can bring to society, right? This does not limit the heights that I can reach, right? And because and, and a lot of times when we, what we face today is that because it is a felony that's associated with our name, we're limited in education. We're limited in access to jobs. We're limited to democracy. Like, you're not good enough. You're not one of us, right? It was that same attitude, uh, uh, along with, I guess, technology, that delayed the, 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 the attention that needed to be placed on police interactions with Black men and boys of color, right? And, and the part of the reason was, you know, you go to the ACLU, uh, for help, but we were not, even to the NAACP, we were not good uh, 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 plaintiffs. We needed the perfect plaintiff to really, to, to launch an investigation or a case of, uh, of police brutality, you know, uh, uh, against some law enforcement agency. It wasn't until the, the, the technology started bringing this thing to the public's light that we were forced to deal with it. Now that we have it, what is the first thing, and I'm sure Attorney Crump may touch on it when he speaks, but the first thing that happens when there's a killing of, of an unarmed black man is that there's reference to a prior criminal history. As if what he did 10, 20 years ago is justification for him to be murdered on the street. That is the power of the narrative. And I'm gonna tell you, we, or you as a, I would say a commission, I would challenge you to be even more courageous because the narrative shift does not start with those out there. The narrative shift starts with us, within us. And how are we looking, how are we viewing, right, that person that just did a drive-by? Are you looking at him in the same light that you would look at with this MacArthur genius fellow, this Time 100 person? And I, I submit to you today that we do because we have to figure out how do we love the most despised among us in order to get our country, our community to a place that we desire to be. That's what I submit to you all today. I, and I wanna end with just this little story I tell. It's kind of controversial, but you know, when, when Chairman Wilson invited me on, she knows she gets what she gets with this, right? I refer everybody, and a lot of times when I talk, I refer everybody back to the Michael Vick incident. Everybody knows Michael Vick, the star football player, and which I was fortunate enough that actually helped. Because of the passage of Amendment 4, I personally was able to help him get registered to vote in 2020, and he was able to vote in the uh, 2020 election. But Michael Vick went to jail for dogfighting. Now, anyone that knows anything about dogfighting knows that it's a very vicious 
violent sport, right? And in South Florida, and, and, and Chairman Wilson knows this, we have cockfighting, right? And where they tie these blades on the talons of roosters and they're going, and these dogs or these roosters, they fight to the death, right? And that scene is very horrific. It's very violent. It's very gory. I always ask people one important question. In the Michael Vick incident, how many people got mad at the dogs? Just stop and think about that for a minute. How many people got mad at those violent dogs that were going back and forth and killing each other and doing drive-bys and whatever it was that they were doing, getting locked up and selling dope and all? How many people got mad at those dogs? No one. What they got mad at was the person that created the conditions in which those dogs went at each other. What they got mad at was the person that, that, that trained the dogs to fight each other to the death. We know what their response was to the dogs, those violent dogs. How can we find them loving homes? The part that where we have to be courageous is how do we respond the people with felony convictions, not with hate or anger or animosity, but with love. And then when we figure that out, and it's easy because all you have to do is ask yourself, how would I react if that was my son or daughter? Right? When we can respond to people with felony convictions with love, that moves the narrative and it changes policies that treats every person, regardless of their sexual identity, immigration status, color of their skin, or even political affiliations with dignity and the respect that all of us deserve. Thank you for letting me speak. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Mead, for bringing all of yourself, uh, for being a genius, uh, and for also reminding us that, uh, about the human nature of what it is we're actually talking about. Uh, black men and boys, first and foremost are human beings. And no matter what condition uh, we are, find ourselves in, uh, we need to be reminded that we are human. And that means that uh, mistakes uh, are made, um, but that doesn't mean that purpose, uh, it should be denied. So I really think that you have um, brought that perspective uh, to this discussion for sure. So thank you for all of your uh, contributions. I want to make sure that we have enough time to hear from all of the panel and then to open this conversation up uh, to uh, the commission. So I'm going to ask uh, uh, Dr. Raymond Hart, who's the executive director for the Council of the Great City Schools, to talk to us uh, because I know you recently released uh, a report, the Academic Key Performance Indicators uh, from your 2020 one report, which included data detailing the disciplinary actions taken against black male students. Uh, in your research, uh, has there been any emerging trends that indicate a relationship between public school discipline and the increased likelihood of a black male student entering the criminal justice system? And how can you expound further on the role that education has uh, in the school to prison pipeline. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Representative Horford, for that question. And uh, thank you all for having me on the panel. Uh, it's an honor and a pleasure to join you this afternoon. And I also uh, want to thank Congresswoman Frederica Wilson uh, as well for her untiring advocacy uh, on behalf of our Black men and young boys of color. I too have had an opportunity to share with you on your 5,000 role models um, program and actually take that program to other school districts around the country. But your partnership over the years has been invaluable to supporting uh, the Black and Brown students that we serve in our member districts. And what we know um, from the data that's already been shared, for example, uh, Assistant Attorney General Kristen Clark has already shared data on the disproportionality um, and disproportionate experiences that our Black men and young boys have, particularly as it relates to negative outcomes in society. In our schools, it starts with our suspensions, which you mentioned uh, about the data that we've collected. Uh, it starts also with sentencing, uh, which was also just addressed by one of my colleagues on the panel a few moments ago in the criminal justice system. 
we must focus on correcting uh, those negative perceptions of men of color in our society that result in that unequal treatment is evidenced by um, a number of different things. Uh, my colleague uh, just spoke about the, um, the sentences of young men being 13% longer for, certain, for the same criminal activity uh, as their white females. What we've also talked, seen, and, and uh, my colleague Desmond Mead just spoke about the narrative. And so I want to address that as well. We see that uh, in our young people, in our young men of color in particular, as evidenced by the video that we all witnessed in a New York mall, where uh, in that mall, a, a white male and a black male were, were uh, in an altercation. The white male was asked to sit politely on the couch and the black male was pinned to the floor and handcuffed. And so it is that narrative, it is that uh, perception that we have of our young men who are uh, young men of color, that even just walking up to them in a mall, we perceive them as being very different. So we need to work on those perceptions. But in addition to addressing those disparate consequences for men of color, we must also invest in supports for our families and children of color and our school districts, and I'll talk more about this in a moment, are taking some of the investments from the American Rescue Plan to really address some of the disproportionate outcomes and the disparities that we see in the data that you just referenced from our reports. And I'll talk more about that in a moment. But first I wanna say, rather than criminalizing the behavior of our young people, we need to make additional resources the consequences of the behaviors that we observe. We criminalize the behavior of young people, particularly young black men, in ways that we don't for other, um, other young people of color. And we have all seen the troubling video of the eight-year-old young man from Syracuse, New York, who was literally crying out for help uh, as a result of the police being called uh, to address his taking of a $3 bag of potato chips from the store. Uh, and that young man, uh, the police response uh, was not ideal. But what I wanna ask is what community supports were brought to bear to help that young man and his family address the underlying needs that they might have. And just a 15 minute conversation between the police and his father Again, first of all, we criminalize that behavior of that eight-year-old rather than treating that behavior as a behavior that needs additional supports, additional wraparound services, uh, additional social work services. So essentially what we allowed was the police to step in and address that young man's behavior, but the police are not qualified to address the social emotional needs of the children that we serve. So helping this young man grow is not the responsibility of the police department, it's really the responsibility of our communities as a whole. And so how are we addressing that behavior by addressing that? And as a commission, I hope you'll begin to advocate for the additional resources that we need, particularly as we, I represent the 77 largest urban school districts in the country. But as we begin to attempt to wrap our arms around students, provide supports to our students, to our young men in both the community as well as in our schools. We need additional resources to help ensure that we can provide those wraparound supports so the activities that we see are not criminalized, but rather supported with resources. The Council of the Great City Schools has established a partnership with the International Association of Chiefs of Police, and we are specifically working to develop a blueprint to support both our schools and our communities address the challenges that we currently face. And I wanna quote one of the police chiefs that's on uh, the, uh, the community, um, on the uh, committee that we've put together to develop this blueprint. And, and that is Chief Sarah Lynn Davis from Memphis, Tennessee. And one of the things that she shared is we the police, we being the police, don't wanna drive around the city arresting students and juveniles. To prevent the police involvement, we must decriminalize juvenile behavior and bring resources to bear that ensure 
that the observed behaviors are met with community support. And dare I ask for the young man who is in Syracuse, dare I ask how many community supports have been brought to bear on his circumstance, the trauma that that young eight-year-old faced, how much support has he received from the community? Were there social workers? Were there others in the community who went to provide supports to that young man, not only to address the, the behavior that we saw, but to ensure that as an eight-year-old, that behavior doesn't continue. And so you talk about the things that escalate into higher and higher behaviors. As an eight-year-old, it's the supports that he needs that are, that are critical. I wanna talk a little bit about our school districts. And so one of the things that you asked Representative Horst or through one of the, some of the things that we're doing, I wanna talk in particular about the Dallas Independent School District uh, and the superintendent there recently established a program called Reset Centers to deal with student classroom behaviors that require students to be referred out of the classroom. And what he looked at was the suspensions in his schools. And again, the disproportionate suspensions for our young black men were much higher in Dallas than they were for the peer, their peers in the school district. But what he did in those research resource set centers is establish an opportunity, first of all, to hire behavioral support counselors and support specialists who sit in a room where if a child who traditionally would have a behavior that would result in a suspension, be sent to that reset center to de-escalate, to deal with the issues and the trauma that that child was facing for that day, and then to ensure that that child, after going through the experience at the reset center, would go back to the classroom. It resulted in from the district having thousands of suspensions of their young black males to having those same suspensions now completely eliminated, having students go to the reset center, but the overwhelming majority, over 90% of those students being able to return to the classroom that very same day and to return to instruction so that we're not removing kids by suspending them, keeping them out of the classroom, but we're enabling them to go back into the classroom. And so it's those types of activities that I think are important. And we must also address and lift up uh, in our schools and, and Congresswoman Wilson, you know this well, uh, recently in the state of Florida, there were a number of books that were banned in the state of Florida that contain the very materials that provide the supports for our students, to the supports for their social and their emotional learning, their social emotional growth. The very same supports that our students need are actually being banned in, our, in some of our states around the country. And so one of the things that we need to do is to make sure that we speak out when those things occur, that we speak out and we support the necessary instructional practices in our schools that help our students become better citizens. And with that, I wanna make sure that I wrap up by saying that our schools are engaged in making sure that we provide the supports to our kids using the American Rescue Plan funds and other resources, but the American Rescue Plan funds are temporary resources. They're gonna go away shortly. And when they go away, what types of resources are we going to bring to bear to help our communities, to help our schools and our school districts continue to provide the supports for our young men, particularly our African-American men and young boys of color in our schools and in the community together. And when we develop the blueprint and publish it, I hope that you will take a look at it as a commission to see the recommendations that we've made in that blueprint for really supporting our students, not just in school, but in school and in the community, because it's that, that combined support that is beneficial. So let's focus on making sure that the resources that we bring to bear address the consequence or that we replace the consequences, the penal consequences of juvenile behavior with resources to address those behaviors directly. And thank you for the opportunity to share. And I look forward to answering other questions as the debate continues. Thank you, Dr. Hardin, for your leadership and for centering the role that schools, particularly public education uh, provides to our uh, students, uh, black uh, boys, and young men and the kind of systemic issues that we have to address in order to make sure that they have an equal uh, and equitable uh, access to uh, a complete education. I wanna move next to Commissioner Calvin Johnson, the Deputy Assistant Secretary at HUD. Uh, in 2014, HUD published 
uh, a report that um, is called Gender, Neighborhood, Context, and Youth Development, which found that boys struggle significantly more than girls to adjust to any type of neighborhood change and can engage in violence and criminal behavior as a response to their new environment. Has HUD found any new data regarding this issue and have any policies been implemented to provide intervention services to boys who are exposed to unstable housing circumstances? Thank you, Commissioner um, Horsford for that question. Um, before I get started, I wanna acknowledge Chairwoman um, Wilson for her leadership um, on this commission um, and really thankful to uh, actually be a part of the, you know, to actually be a part of this discussion. So let me um, first start by providing some background on this report that you mentioned. Um, and to do that, I need to talk about um, the actual study. So in 1992, Congress actually appropriated $70 million in Section 8 rental assistance to fund additional vouchers to support the, the actual study where these findings are from, and that is the Moving to Opportunity for Fair Housing demonstration. Now, this demonstration set out to actually assess the impact of neighborhoods on adult and child well-being. Specifically, what we were trying to learn is when families move from public housing in very poor areas to private market housing or <laughs> private market rental housing um, in areas with much, with much lower poverty rates, do we see improvement in well-being? Now, this demonstration was open to the largest public housing authorities. Five were actually selected. You had Baltimore, Austin, Chicago, Los Angeles, New York. Now, eligible families had to have at least one dependent child and they had to be living in public housing projects located in the poorest neighborhoods um, in the city. That is 40% poverty or higher. 46,000 families were deemed eligible and they were assigned to three groups, right? So this is like a lottery of sorts, right? They were assigned to three groups. The first group was they could receive one of the housing choice vouchers, but that housing choice voucher could only be used in a low poverty neighborhood, less than 10% poverty. So they were moving. So the idea here was that they were moving from very poor neighborhoods to low poverty neighborhoods. And so let's just call that the low poverty voucher group. You had a second group um, also receiving a housing choice voucher, but without any geographic restriction. So it's just a regular voucher. They could use it wherever they would otherwise use a voucher. We can call that the regular voucher group. And then it was a third group. And that group were folk, again, we're talking about um, families uh, living in public housing. That group just remained in public housing. So when we fast forward now and we talk about gender neighborhood context and youth development, that's a summary report from an expert convening that we sponsored to actually discuss the surprising findings from the study, specifically the differential impact for boys and girls that, you know, that you mentioned. Now let's talk about those findings. The findings were that um, there was reduced rates of mental health problems for girls whose family moved uh, to low poverty areas. So they had low poverty vouchers, right? And for boys, there was an increased rate of post-traumatic stress disorder for those boys with families who had the regular vouchers. Now, when we talk about crime and delinquency or, or the delinquent activities, the data actually show us that um, there was no effect of low poverty vouchers on actual arrest. That is those reporting having been arrest ever. However, compared to girls in public housing, so now we're looking at girls. So girls who were living, who actually moved to, had vouchers to move to low poverty areas, comparing them to the girls in public housing, the girls who moved to low poverty areas had, um, had, had actually engaged in more assaultive behavior. And when we look at boys in public housing and we compare them to boys who had the low poverty voucher or they were in the low poverty voucher group, they were more likely to report um, being arrested for property crimes. Now, keep in mind that these were uh, groups of boys and girls who were actually um, surveyed four years after they had received the vouchers and moved. So if we fast forward six years, we look at a different group 
of kids. These would have been younger kids back in 2001, right? When the actual results uh, were actually being generated. If we now fast forward six years, we look at the younger kids now who have had longer time in, in uh, these low poverty neighborhoods and we don't see the same pattern of assault of assaultive behavior. We don't see the same patterns of property crime. So, you know, it's it's important now to think about two things. One, not only about neighborhood. Neighborhood context matters, and it probably matters the longer you are in a neighborhood, right? So, low poverty neighborhoods. The longer you're in them, you may benefit from that. Um, high poverty neighborhoods. The longer you're in them you probably won't benefit. And there's a huge literature out there that looks at the impact of poverty and high crime on mental well-being. Now, to be clear about all of this, parents were offered the um, opportunity to move. And so let's talk about why parents move. Parents move because they thought that by moving, um, they would be moving to a safer neighborhood. Check, that happened. They also thought that their children would have access to better schools. So parents were basically making these moves because, or they wanted to actually participate because this gave them an opportunity to move to safer neighborhoods and, and neighborhoods where kids would have access to better schools. Now, what we also find for parents is that there was reduced rates of mental problems for parents, right? Lower psychological stress, depression, and anxiety. And there was an increased rate of calm and peacefulness amongst these parents. So what do we gather from all of this? Well, what we gather from this is that, you know, we've, we've long known that our intervention, our housing interventions have a greater impact on children, right? So we need to focus our attention. We need to provide additional attention uh, to that finding and the fact that we see findings that really affect children. There is very little impact other than the ones I just mentioned for the parents. And so we need to do that. So when, we, so, so when you ask the question about policies and activities, I can tell you some of the things that we're doing that, um, that I think points to how the findings from this study uh, is really having us think about policies and, and programs within the agency. So I can talk about um, programs that we have in public housing that we are seeing as a model. So we have service coordinators in public housing that really serve um, as um, uh, a place where um, residents can go and get assessed and then linked to services. We call those Ross service coordinators. Um, they develop strategies and they plug residents into a broader ecosystem of services within the, the, the community. And so that's a model that we might explore to figure out how that might work for um, the voucher side of the house. We also have community health workers. Uh, we are working with the Office of Minority Health in five communities, specifically to use community health workers to do the type of work, to do the type of outreach and working with residents to plug them in to the types of services that they need. Um, um, you know, many of you may not know, but community health centers, the federally qualified health centers, there are over 300 of these in or, in, or like nearby housing authorities and making connections with those community health centers to ensure that they are uh, kind of providing services and doing the assessments so that when parents have issues with kids, that those are actually flagged and they're linked to services. And then finally, um, in 2000, in our 2023 budget, we're hoping uh, that we will uh, have funds appropriated that will allow us to do technical assistance for um, mental health first aid. That is working with housing authorities to train the frontline workers in housing authority to identify uh, mental health issues and start flagging them and then linking them to services. Now, um, it would be remiss if I didn't tell you about the longer term studies. We talked about the impact on children in 2001 and 2007. Let's fast forward a little bit. When we now look at these um, children who were uh, part of this demonstration and we look at them uh, when they were in their teens, we fast forward now to when they're in their late 20s, early 30s. And what we find using uh, uh, IRS data 
is that those kids who were, who had vouchers and moved to low poverty communities or had vouchers and just moved anywhere, right? Had higher levels of income than the kids who stayed behind in public housing, had higher rates of college participation than the kids who actually stayed behind in public housing. And that that difference was greater for kids who moved to low income communities or they were in the group that had the voucher restricted to low in, uh, to low poverty areas. Now, what that tells us is that place matters. Place, ask, place matters and I'll stop there. Well, I was just gonna ask if you could wrap up uh, any other final, I don't wanna cut you off because what you're saying is very important uh, information around how zip code should not have to dictate a person's success in life. Exactly right. Um, and I know Secretary Fudge and, and the leadership that you all are providing in HUD is addressing that, but, but we really, I mean, one of the policies that Congress has passed that has lifted 50% of children, particularly black children out of poverty was a child tax credit. So if we really wanna talk about policies that would help move people out of poverty, we just have to keep them out of poverty um, by, by leveraging the policies that really work. But um, I, I, I wanted to make sure that you had time to wrap up your comments. We have one more uh, person that needs to go and then I wanna open up to conversation. Okay. All right, thank you. So next, and, and to come back to uh, uh, Commissioner Clark and the Assistant Attorney General, uh, you recently delivered a keynote speech regarding the civil rights implications of artificial intelligence, which is a pretty hot topic. Uh, can you discuss some of the potential impacts that this new technology could have on the impartial and fair treatment of black men and boys, specifically any data that may indicate racial bias in police surveillance technology that uh, the commission should be aware of. Thank you. Yeah, thank you um, very much for the question. We are looking at algorithmic bias and algorithmic discrimination uh, in many different contexts. We're looking at the barriers that this can present in accessing jobs, in accessing housing, uh, in accessing educational opportunity. What we're finding is that there are entities that are increasingly relying on data to make predictive judgments. And that often the, algorithm, the algorithms that are employed to make these predictive judgments have bias baked into them. Um, We've all seen the problems of the use of, um, uh, of, of this technology in the policing context. And we're very concerned about jurisdictions that are increasingly relying uh, you know, on, on data to surveil, uh, to determine which communities uh, they are going to uh, you know, focus attention on. Um, we are in the process at looking at this issue across the Civil Rights Division and working with partners at other agencies, including the EEOC, the Consumer Fi Financial Protection Bureau, and other agencies to figure out how we can use the tools that we have to confront some of the new and emerging problems and biases that we see in this context. Thank you, Commissioner Clark. And I know it's an emerging issue and we look forward to hearing more from you. So um, Dr. Williams, I wanna be sensitive. I know there's a, a business meeting that we have to complete as well. Uh, so how much time do we have for uh, the, the, the dialogue portion of this? With the you, have, you, have, you have about 25 minutes. That includes the business agenda? I thought there was a uh, business. The, the business agenda is a, it's a um, um, Commissioner Horsford, the business agenda is very, very short. Um, probably won't take any more than about seven to 10 minutes. All right. Okay, well, then good. We have plenty of time and we've covered a lot already uh, today. So I, I wanna open it up uh, to the panel and to the commissioners at this time. Uh, I think probably the best way if you can raise your hand or flag for me that you're interested in, in talking. And um, again, I wanna defer first to Chair Wilson uh, from your leadership and based on the dialogue that we've had, you know, we're, we're centering today's discussion on the criminal justice system, but part of what we've heard is there's so many elements that contribute to how black men and boys are ultimately affected by the criminal justice system that, you know, start 
in education and housing and healthcare, in access to employment and jobs, and these contributing elements and lack of opportunity um, and how people are even viewed in the public from a human nature um, is, is all of what we're trying to confront on this issue. Uh, so first, if we could go to uh, uh, Commissioner Marshall, Joseph Marshall, uh, for your question. Got on mute here. Okay, can you hear me? Everybody hear me? I think I turned off my camera at the same time. Okay, everyone hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, thank you for thank you for the discussion. Um, just a couple of things. That you, you did cover a lot. Um, uh, first of all, I got to say to Desmond Mead, uh, congratulations um, on uh, everything. And I got to just say, as a fellow. MacArthur Award recipient, that's really cool. So I'm glad for you, brother. <laughs> it's gonna help a lot. <laughs> um, uh, it, 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 one of the issues for me and the work that I do as an educator and into a lot of prisons, working with a lot of brothers that have been in prison, recidivism is often pretty high. And one of the best things about prison is that it's, it's way more about punishment than about rehabilitation. And I, I'm wondering if there's something that, I know that there's something needs to be done about uh, preparing men to enter back into society and it must be done intentionally. Uh, often what I see in, with working with, with men who get out is that they're not prepared to get out. And uh, unless they bump into somebody, many times a lifer or an OG, uh, who happens to begin to get their mind in order so that they can come back into society and, and not go back in. Uh, that just doesn't happen. So I don't know if there's anything we can do policy-wise. I know years ago they took out Pell Grants. I don't know if that's back in. They, they, they removed a lot of things that would prepare uh, men to re-enter. Uh, but we got to get past this, I think, this punishment uh, mindset and to a to real rehabilitation mindset. I, that to me, that shouldn't be hard to do. But again, that's the narrative you were talking about. And it, it's, a, it's, it's tough anyway, but if in fact you're in a system that only wants to punish, doesn't see any value in preparing you to return, it, it, it's going to be increasingly tough. And that's why Anybody, to me, anybody that gets out and is able to turn their life and get out, and I call it getting out and staying out, I really congratulate because I know that system does not want you to do that. In fact, I'm sure you know this. I, I've seen people in there uh, say to people when they got out, I know you're coming back. I'll hold your bed for you. Uh, that, that, whole, that whole conversation has happened. So uh, I would be happy to advocate for any kind of policies that went from uh, strictly punishment, overwhelmingly punishment to uh, to rehabilitative efforts inside the system. I hope that makes sense to you. And, and let me go to Dr. McKeever and then have Desmond uh, Mead respond. I want to get as many questions from the commission as possible. Uh, thank you. Um, and thank you so much, <clears throat> Chairwoman Wilson, for starting us with this uh, powerful roundtable that we've had today. Um, I work for the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. I'm a public health physician. And one of the first assignments I had at the Baltimore City Health Department was to stand up a youth violence prevention program that intervened for adolescents who at that time when I was working in Baltimore, homicide was the number one cause of, of death for these young men. And it was not just about those who were victims of the violence, but those who per perpetrated the violence, which entered in through um, some of the ways which we've discussed today and the lifelong effects of those things. And so much of what you talked about today resonates uh, with the work I've done over the years in these areas. Um, I, I have a question that I, I really would like to hear perspectives from some of the panelists. We, we have to, as we think about the social status of black men and boys, social determinants of health, so where we live, work, grow, and play, um, these have a tremendous impact on the health of our black men and our boys. And some of you touched on, for example, the importance of mental health resources and linking um, individuals to care. But I would like to hear if there's 
uh, considerations that you have from your respective um, your your perspectives on what the council should be think commission should be thinking about as we explore the connection of health and the criminal justice system. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Mr. Mead, would you like to touch on the first question, and then if there's a panelist uh, who would like to respond to Dr. McKeever. All right, well, first of all, thank you, uh, Ms. Marshall, for your question. You know, there was a study done in Florida uh, back in 2011 that uh, and they looked at around 40,000 individuals that were released uh, from incarceration. And, and what they found was that uh, while at the time Florida had a recidivism rate of around 33.1%, when they looked at individuals whose civil rights were restored, where they were able to vote, they were able to get occupational licenses and, 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 and further education, they've seen a reduction of the recidivism rate from 33.1 to 11.4%, right? And so we, we, we do know that, at least as it relates to recidivism, that the quicker, the sooner you will help an individual reintegrate back into their community, the least likely they are uh, to commit another offense which I wanna to touch on the voting piece because that is the one, uh, during elections is the one time of the year when people like me are made to feel like we're not a part of society, right? That's that, it's not during uh, Christmas or Easter or, or Labor Day, it's always during election when we're painfully reminded that you're not part of us, you know? And, 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 and because of that, that, ostr that being ostracized, that actually increased the likelihood of us actually uh, uh, going back in the prison, along with a study that was done by Florida State uh, University that showed that we've all heard that if you call a child stupid, they're gonna grow up and think they're what? They grow up and think that they're stupid. And the Florida State University found that there was a correlation between calling someone an offender, calling someone a, a, a felon or a convict to recidivate, right? And so that's why organizations throughout the country have been fighting so hard to change how we're being referred. You know, in some areas, it's justice impacted people, you know, and then in some areas, it's like returning citizens. But that is, that is an important factor uh, in when we're talking about dealing with recidivism. I understand that there are issues with whether or not our carceral system is rehabilitative or, uh, or retributive, right? But what we do know, while we're, while we're dealing with policies to, to change whatever approach incarceration need to have, that there's also the ostracizing of individuals on the outside, and there are some things that we can do. Uh, uh, Chairwoman Wilson, you know, even in Dade County, there are organizations um, one led by uh, Leroy Jones, right? Uh, Circle of Brotherhood, that they're organizations of, of returning citizens or people who've been impacted that can form a, a support network. And the beautiful thing about it is while they're forming the support network and helping address issues about jobs and education, they're also uh, getting them more civically engaged. And we know that a person that is gonna be engaged in voting is going to be even uh, uh, less likely to actually uh, uh, engage in, in criminal activities and, and end up becoming incarcerated again. So, uh, you know, I, I do like your question. I think that there are things that we can do uh, during incarceration as well as post incarceration uh, that can help shift things around. And even if they still want to punish an individual, you know, it should not be that, you know, when you walk out the prison gates, that's when the real punishment begins. It shouldn't be that way. And so if we could eliminate that piece, right, it would go a long ways towards getting where you know we need to be. And last but not least, just a touch, I think the one thing that we, we, we cannot lose sight of, and I'm telling you, it took maybe several years ago, it dawned on me for the first time, is that mental health of Black men and boys as it relates to a lot of people don't understand, especially with our boys, there's two things that sticks out to me. Number one, a lot of our black boys, our black children are going to school hungry. 
right, are going to school hungry and are not able to really focus in on their studies. But the other thing is that they're actually suffering from post-traumatic stress syndrome. We think it's only reserved for people who are in battles, but we have kids as, as young as five, six years old that is suffering and taking that trauma with them throughout their childhood into adulthood. And, and, and we cannot ignore that. And so I just wanted to make sure that I, I raised that issue up. Thank you. Dr. Us. Hart, I did want to ask if you could expound on the issue of mental health, particularly as it pertains uh, to the question that Dr. McKeever has and, and with the limited amount of mental health resources that are already out there, what does that mean to the situation for black men and boys? And then I'm gonna to come to uh, Congressman uh, Johnson and, and Commissioner Rhodes uh, for our final questions. Dr. Hart. I just wanted to quickly thank you to lift up that uh, in our schools and when it, as it relates to health, one of the things that we've recognized in a number of our communities is that our communities have health deserts and a number of our schools are in health deserts where our children don't have access. And as Desmond Mead just pointed out, a lot of our students can't access education because they can't get beyond the other challenges, health and other issues being uh, some of those challenges. And I'll give you some data. The first of which is that a number of our schools have begun to lift up health clinics to provide supports to our kids because they recognize that those supports and those wraparound services again are needed. The challenge is funding them. But in DC, for example, during the pandemic, when, um, when the vaccines were rolled out for the pan pandemic in Washington, DC, for children five to 17 years old, when those uh, vaccines were available in Northwest DC, which is a far more affluent part of DC, the, the vaccination rates for children five to 17 was 75%, 65% in some of those wards. In Southeast DC, in the wards that are predominantly black wards, the vaccination rates were, were around 20 to 25%. What happened as a result of that is because of the CDC quarantine policies around exposure to COVID-19, those quarantines for kids who were in African-American communities, and this occurred across the country in Cleveland and other cities across the country, the, those students then had to be quarantined for longer periods of time. So because they didn't have access to the same health care as their peers, when they got exposed to the vaccine, their quarantine periods were 10 days initially, five days eventually, but the amount of time that they missed from school and instruction was significantly higher. That's just one example, but that example plays out as it relates to health, mental health, trauma, and PTSD, and other challenges that our students face when they come to school uh, every day. So the lifting of the health supports that our kids need is vital to keeping them in school and then ultimately trying to prevent some of the outcomes that we see later on in life. Thank you. Thank you. Panelist, Congressman Johnson. Uh, thank you, Representative Horsford. I wanted to um, uh, talk about the fact that the war on drugs, which began under Richard Nixon in 1971, and which uh, is documented to have been a political uh, tactic, this war on drugs, which pitted white fear against black people, um, has been an abysmal failure, both in America and also to the south of our borders. Um, this war on drugs has criminalized what is essentially a public health issue, addiction. And I think that you will find that most of the people who are placed under arrest in this country have either alcohol or drugs in their system. So there's, there's something to be said of how are we treating this uh, scourge of uh, substance abuse that plagues America. When white folks tend to um, fall into uh, substance abuse, uh, and exhibit A is the opioid epidemic that ravaged the, um, the rural countryside in America and seeped into the suburban and urban uh, communities. It's been treated as a public health issue as opposed to a criminal justice issue. But when the crack cocaine epidemic ravaged 
the inner cities of America's black communities, it was handled as a criminal justice issue. And in fact, the penalties for possessing uh, crack cocaine, the disparity between in sentencing was 100 to 1 between uh, cocaine and crack cocaine, which, by the way, contained just a, a speck of uh, actual cocaine. And so this criminalization of drug usage and addiction needs to come to an end, and the nation needs to shift its focus and resources into education and drug treatment. And in that way, uh, we would take the brunt of the drug war off of the black and brown communities of this country and also restore health to the entire uh, nation because we're actually, as Brother uh, Desmond talked about, treating uh, folks with love and compassion as opposed to uh, vindictiveness and punishment. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Rhodes, uh, Rhodes, did you have anything? I saw your hand up earlier. I, I did. It was partially addressed um, by a colleague, uh, Raymond Hart. It's good to see you, sir. And uh, a stalwart in the education community, one that we're, we're supportive of here at the Department of Ed. I'm Christian Rhodes, senior advisor to the secretary. And there was one piece, I just think, kind of to pull some of these pieces together that are, is probably important just to call out for the public's purposes, but also something that Ray Hart said that I think is worth underscoring is the role of the community um, in um, setting the conditions in which our young Black men and boys are able to thrive and succeed. And while the schoolhouse is oftentimes a centerpiece of community, likely because of the, the large number of buildings that are within a city or a community, um, I think the, what happens after 3.30, you know, between 7.30 and 3.30 is important. What happens after 3.30 to the next 7.30 a.m. is important as well. And we didn't speak a lot about the, the role of quality youth programming um, as, a, as a preventative measure to ensure that our boys and youth in particular um, are, are afforded the opportunity to, to reach the fullest potential. And you know, Ray, I know that there's research out there that speaks to the role of community schools, which is an area that I think a number of us are supportive of. I'd love to get just your thoughts on um, evidence of which, um, you know, host, you know, whole full service community schools or promised neighborhood like activities support kind of the entire child, but also provide a preventative measure as it relates to the criminal justice system. Great. I'll defer to uh, Dr. Hart, and I also see Attorney Crump is joining us. Yes. And also related to that legislation um, is the uh, bill that I know I'm leading and, and other members of the Congressional Black Caucus around breaking the cycle of violence and the funding that is uh, uh, identified in the president's budget around both community violence intervention to stem violence in our community, uh, addressing crime, uh, but also funding community-based uh, solutions, including from our faith-based partners that we know would work, including summer employment for young people, uh, specifically Black men and boys, which have higher rates of unemployment. So Dr. Hart, can you speak to both of those elements? And then Attorney Crump, I'm going to come to you. Let's... Uh... Representative Horsford, I'll defer my, my response to uh, Attorney Crump. Great. Yes, well, let's go to... This is special. He is at a funeral. <laughs> right. Attorney Trump, thank you so much uh, for your dedication. I know you are in the midst of uh, yet another unfortunate uh, funeral that you are attending, uh, but we wanted to have your perspective uh, on this panel today and Chairwoman Wilson uh, worked hard to make sure you were part of it. So we will uh, bring you into the conversation. Th thank you so much. Uh, as Representative Wilson knows, we are continually battling on the front line. And my great fraternity brother, Representative Hank Johnson, I am here in Cold Rainy, Michigan, with your colleague, Congresswoman uh, Lawrence. And we are leaving the celebration of life for Patrick Leola, a brother who uh, 
dog who is escaping from a violent situation uh, in Africa to safe haven here in the United States of America. But yet again, Representative Wilson, we saw over policing in our community, police using excessive force on unarmed black people, especially our men and our boys. Patrick had never been convicted of any felony conviction or anything like that. He was a brother here pursuing the American dream, but yet this police officer who is unnamed to this day, he escalated a simple misdemeanor traffic stop to warn of deadly execution with him putting a bullet in the back of Patrick Leola's brain while he was unarmed face down. And you don't have to take Ben Crump's word for it or uh, Attorney Ben Johnson's word for it. Look at the video for yourself. And I say this as we're talking about the study of violence against men and boys, black men and boys in America. You know, Congresswoman Wilson, we've been at this a long time since Martin Lee Anderson in 2006. And if we have all these world leaders condemning Russian soldiers for shooting unarmed citizens in the back of the head in the Ukraine, then why are they not condemning shooting unarmed black citizens in the back of the head in Grand Rapids, Michigan? We have to fight for equal justice for our black men and boys like never before. We thought the George Floyd, uh, Representative Johnson, that we would see uh, a deterrent. We would see some of these her atrocities slow down. We wouldn't see so many hashtags, Mr. Hart. Uh, but yet, I tell you, time and time again, we get the calls in the middle of the night. And again, it's another senseless, just senseless killing of another young black man and boy. So I, I thank you all for your leadership of giving a voice to the voiceless fighting for these young black men who don't have a voice unless y'all have the courage to do it. And uh, as I go to the cemetery, I will let the family know, Congresswoman Wilson, that you will add Patrick Leola's name to the roll to say that we must protect our black men and boys and declare that they have an equal opportunity at life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Thank you so much, Attorney Crump. Chair Wilson, would you like to yes. say anything on behalf of the commission? Yes, I would. Thank you so much. And uh, we just applaud your courage, your perseverance, and everything that you do to keep the subject on the forefront of the national news so that this work that we're trying to achieve on the commission of the social status of Black men and boys is amplified through your actions and Reverend Shopton's actions as you carry on the work of what is happening with our Black men and boys. So we send our condolences to the Laoya family. Let them know that we are on the case and we will not stop <laughs> until we have resolved the issue of holding police officers accountable. They need to be sued. They need to be arrested. And we, as a commission, are dedicated to that mission. So thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. God bless you. And I apologize. I need to get to the cemetery. And I will let Reverend Al know your message, Congresswoman Wilson. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, Commission, you know, this has been a quite a um, impactful roundtable, to say the least. And I want to close by thanking uh, Chair Wilson and our entire panel uh, for all that they have shared today. Um, I want you to know that we will be taking all of your 
uh, insights that you have shared today, as well as some of the recommendations, and it will help to inform uh, the work uh, of this commission going forward. Uh, you have educated and uh, helped pro provide uh, expertise and perspectives to the commission and to the viewing public, I might add. We've, we've had this uh, be, being aired, uh, and this is information that will be acted upon uh, through formal recommendations for legislation and policy changes at every uh, level and branch of government, not just in Congress, but through the executive branch um, and, and hopefully through the courts. So I wanna thank all of our panel. Let's give them a round of applause for their participation uh, today. And to uh, our chairwoman and all of the commissioners for their engagement and questions. Uh, and Madam Chair, I will turn uh, the meeting back over to you. I understand there's some final business uh, for us to take before we close. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Secretary Horsford and uh, uh, Commissioner Horsford and all of our panelists for such an outstanding and engaging discussion. Let's give uh, our commentator, Mr. Horsford, who can join MSNBC <laughs> as a commentator. Let's give him a great big round of applause. He did an excellent job. Thank you so much, just as I knew you would. Now we're going to turn our attention to the business portion of the meeting. Due to time constraints, given the round table, we will move very quickly through these items. The, miss, the minutes from the commission's January 2022 meeting is in the meeting packet sent by the program manager. Uh, are there any corrections to the minutes as distributed? If there are no further corrections, I have a motion to, can I have a motion to approve the previous meeting minutes? Move approval the minutes. Is there a second? Second. The minutes stand approved as distributed. Today we will vote to approve the appointments of commission members to the 2022 annual report subcommittee. I've appointed Commissioner Farston to serve as chair given his experience drafting comprehensive reports of this kind. The other committee members are Commissioners Marshall, Bowman, Jeffries, Claude, Johnson, and myself and Reverend Sharpton. Our program manager, Dr. Williams and commission staff will of course pull together the necessary reports research and documents for the reports and transcribe our policy recommendations as we move forward. We will ask Commissioner Foston to schedule a subcommittee meeting to review the recommended timeline for completion of the report that has been prepared by the commission staff. Is there a motion to approve the appointments to the annual report subcommittee? I move that, the, <clears throat> that they be approved. Is there a second? I second the motion. All those in favor, the motion Aye. carries. For the second, for the record, please find in your packet the program manager's report. It is my understanding that the job description for additional commission staff has been developed and posted and the budget request for the commission's FY23 operation has been submitted is that correct, Dr. Williams? Yes, ma'am, that is correct. Okay, we will have a fuller discussion of these and other matters at the next meeting. Are there any matters of, or new business the commission will bring up this time? Adopted earlier in January, our next quarterly meeting will be held on um, January 8, 2022. We may schedule a short administrative meeting in the interim, but that meeting will focus on prevention. We're gonna have a round table on prevention and Dr. McIver, you will be working with healthcare. All of the, we can do to prevent uh, all the catastrophic things that help happen to black men and boys. And we will be focusing on education mentoring, fatherhood, family, children. We'll have some children testify and you can question them. 
will have some children from uh, as young as middle school who have come up about uh, something with the law and they will be able to talk to you about what they feel could have helped them uh, not be in that position. So um, you will receive an email reminder, including all correspondence related to the quarterly meeting from the program manager. In the interim, if you have any questions, Peel, please feel free to contact me or Marvin. At this time, I would like to thank each and every one of you for your commitment to this commission. Remember our mission, and as long as we continue to work with one mind, our work will not be in vain. Thank you so much. This has been a very powerful day in America, and it's been recorded and shared, and God bless all of you. Thank you. Without objection, I move to adjourn. Uh, ma'am, I just have, um, ma'am, this is Marvin. I just have one um, a, a, a program. You said January. Uh, ma actually, the next meeting is July 8th, ma'am. Did I say January? Yes, ma'am. No. Ma'am, you, you went too far ahead of us, ma'am. July. Okay. Thank you. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you.